So um, hello and welcome to our first afternoon workshop on day two of the Sustaining Church Conference. Um, it's a real joy to be here with you today. And um, our first presentation is a really good one. It's by Emily Allen. And Emily is an MA student of systematic and philosophical theology at the University of Nottingham. She recently graduated from Trinity College in Bristol, where she completed a dissertation on reconciliation in the context and practice of the Eucharist. She's also a member of the Young Christian Climate Network. And this isn't in her bio, but I will attest the fact she's an amazing person. So um, just as a general endorsement of her. And the presentation is titled Ecofeminism and Theology. What has Mary got to do with the climate crisis? So Emily, over to you um, for your talk. Thank you, Luke. So in this short presentation, I will give a brief insight into the work of Catholic and feminist theologian, Sarah Jane Boss, and present the emerging conversation termed Green Mariology. This will offer a critique of modern Western attitudes to the environment by relating these to contemporary interpretations of Mary, the mother of God, in order to understand their connection to one another. I will consider how historically, Mariology has been deeply connected to the church's theology of creation and the ways in which both our theology of Mary and creation have been changed and adapted to suit the needs of the Western ideologies that have in part contributed to the crisis we face today. Although these theologies are not always preached or consciously acknowledged, these attitudes are communi communicated to us each day and inevitably shape the way that we live and interact with God and all created things. And so in every age of the church, part of our task is always to consider the beliefs that we hold, to bring theology into a shared space and dialogue, and to discern as the church with the spirit, whether our ideas about God and the world are in line with the revelation of God in Christ. And in our case today, whether these are in line with what is revealed in God's partnership with Mary. This presentation will firstly outline the traditional interpretation of Mary, which held her as a symbol of all creation in relation to God, and therefore offered a theology of creation. I will then examine how modern attitudes of individualism have threatened and changed these approaches. And I will trace how this can be observed both in Marian imagery, as well as through changes in our relationship to the environment in the West. I will then briefly conclude with some insights from the non-Western Mariology approaches, a Mariology that is more traditional and therefore offers a different theology of creation to the one that is embedded in our Western attitudes. And so to begin, in order to set the scene of Boss's work, I will consider how Mary has traditionally been understood as a symbol of all creation in relation to God. This is the starting point from which we understand the link between the person of Mary and of her son Jesus and the rest of creation. So when we read the account of the Annunciation in the Gospel of Luke, commentators know echoes to the opening of Genesis the early earth without form and void is likened to the virginity of Mary. Nothing as yet has been created within her. And the spirit hovering over these waters at the beginning, so too the spirit overshadows Mary in this new beginning. And as God speaks and creates, so Mary responds to the words of the angel, let it be to me according to your word. As Christians, we confess that the conception of Jesus is a turning point in history, the beginning of a new creation in which God himself indwells in the womb of Mary, is formed and carried through into an earthly life. And it is only this language of creation and the placement of this event in the story of God's redemption of all creation that accounts for the cosmic significance of the conception of Jesus in the waters of Mary's womb. And of course, Jesus was not just divine, but we confess his full and genuine humanity, which he shares with all flesh and which he takes on from Mary's body, 
our body that as we have seen is likened to and identified with the early earth and thereby all creation so as to be received and redeemed in Christ. Boss writes that it was precisely because Mary's humanity in some way participated in the whole substance of the universe that the humanity of her son could provide the place where God would bind himself to that universe and thus sanctify it. And so at once, Mary signifies the old and chaotic ways and the calling of all creation back into a restored relationship and partnership with God and with others. As Eve was understood to be the mother of creation and through the fall bore children into a world bound by death, Mary is the mother of the new creation, birthing that which brings life in the place of death. Mary, therefore, is a human in partnership with God. God not having forced himself upon Mary, but exalted her to a position that her culture would never have given her, living as co-creator alongside God, being brought into his work in the world. And a reminder to the church of the grace of God and his intention for us as creatures and creation. Furthermore, the tradition of Mary's assumption into heaven also demonstrates this new creation, no longer separated or touched by decay and death, but remaining in eternal life. And she is also therefore traditionally given the title Queen of Heaven and remains in partnership with God even now to bring about the healing of all things. So in this second section of the presentation, I will now consider how the current climate crisis is at its heart a crisis of relationships, or to be more specific, a crisis born out of the favouring of individualism. This will aid our understanding of how modern interpretations of creation, Mary, and by extension Jesus, are threatened by these attitudes. So Boss explores the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, a social philosophy that considers the power dynamics of relationships in society. And the critical theory suggests that human beings tend to want to differentiate themselves from one another, from the world around them, from the natural world, and even from ourselves, all in an effort that these distinctions will enable the overcoming of limitations imposed on us by these others in order that we might dominate, hold power over and find freedom from them. At the centre of Boss's argument is the belief that the self as individual, distinct and separate as a primary means of self-understanding is a modern idea and in fact a detrimental one. It is, she explains, contrary to our understanding of the person and work of Christ and the biblical account of the world. We perceive the world as, set, as a set of distinct things set apart by boundaries, boundaries between people, time and place. We understand human beings as individuals separate from one another. Even our bodies and the world is made up of parts, distinct and unique, even in their working together. And so perhaps our instinct as modern Western people is not to see ourselves as connected to those around us, certainly not connected to our ancestors, and certainly not to consider how we might share an identity with a first Palestinian Jew and his mother. And Bosch challenges this view outright, saying, it may be that the solidarity of things, one with another, and of God with creation is a more fundamental truth about the world than is their separation from one another. And so as we understand Jesus not to have just become an individual man, separated and independent from creation, but one who took on the flesh of creation and recreated it from the ruins of this old, we ought to consider Mary anew and with fresh perspective for when we consider Mary, we consider ourselves and all creation, 
and find a solidarity that overrides individuality, a challenge to the Western theology and attitudes that we proclaim with our lifestyles today. So around the period of the Reformation, the Western world was becoming the place of enlightenment and rationalism. And it is in this time that nature was increasingly perceived as separate from the creator. As Boss understands it, nature became desacralized, that is, no longer regarded as sacred. And I want to pause here to note that by sacred, we do not mean divine. Boss is not wanting to promote pantheism. The world, and Mary for that matter, is not identified as God to be worshipped or to be understood as a direct revelation in that sense. But the material is the place in which God chooses to dwell and to make himself known. And therefore, as the Ark of the Covenant was not God itself God, but was a vessel for his presence, creation is to be treated with a sense of dignity as the dwelling place of God. In more traditional approaches, the sanctity then of Mary and creation is given this title of sacred because of its relation to God. And continuing with Boss's argument then, the desacralization and separation of nature from God resulted in nature becoming the object of scrutiny, of rationalization, and with the rise of capitalism and technology, the natural world was seen more and more as an object to be dominated and exploited. In her book, Empress and Handmaid, on nature and gender in the cult of the Virgin Mary, Boss argues that the changes in images and devotion to Mary throughout the last millennium, particularly in the West, reveal deeper changes in Western society regarding our attitudes towards nature. That is to say that modern Western views of gender are related to its views of the natural world. These images reveal the ideologies of dominance and possession that shape the Western world today and our theology of creation and women in particular. So Mary, the mother of God, particularly within medieval Christianity, was often uh, portrayed at the scene of the visit of the Magi who came to worship the King Jesus, descended of the line of David, a heritage that Jesus shares with and gains from his mother. And it is, as I've said, not Mary who's worshipped here, but she is acknowledged as having, as having been from a kingly line herself, the Queen Mother, exalted by God to bear the life of this new creation, and is therefore, as we have said, the mother of this new creation. And so during the Reformation period, the Enlightenment, all these changes, the place of a mother's influence was reinforced and confined to the nursery. And her place was in submission to the Christian father. Though some of these ideas uh, have previously existed, it is here that we see a shift in Western imagery, in Marian imagery and devotion. And this shift coincided with the favoring of the enlightened, rational and technologically advanced emerging culture of the West. So Mary became the new female ideal and also remained a symbol of Western attitudes towards nature. No longer a figure of maternal authority imagined in an exalted place, she is envisioned as the model disciple in humble submission to God at the Annunciation the human partnership in God's redemptive act to all creation is overridden and sidelined, no longer understood to bear this importance. And so the medieval imagery of Mary, the mother of God, queen of heaven, enthroned with Christ on her lap and seated in royalty, is far removed from modern and recent imagery of the lowly, childless and humbled handmaiden of the Lord, whose gaze does not meet our eyes, the new model of discipleship. Boss points out how the modern Western views of women have translated into a different depiction of Mary. And as Boss terms it, the pornographic way that Mary has been made the object 
of the onlooker's gaze rather than as the previous subject of the image, causing us to gaze into Christ. More frequently in the West, we speak of Mary as virgin instead of mother, or not and mother, emphasizing this former quality in favor of the latter. So far from the song of the Magnificat, the song in which Mary praises God for lifting up the lowly, we now perceive creation embodied in Mary as that which submits to God's will in a docile and passive way, ideal for the modern self who is liberated from the strains of connection and relationship and can now freely and legitimately exert power over others in the name of God and silencing those who are to reflect the lowly Mary. The modern Mary, understood throughout church history as a symbol of creation in relationship to God, now demonstrates a modern and thwarted theology of creation, embodied in a girl who is the icon of the creature subordinated to a remote Lord. To put it more broadly, Voss writes, increasing domination over human and non-human nature has caused an alteration in the Christian understanding of the relationship between God and creation. And Western Christianity has in turn not challenged, but legitimized this claim and theology of possession. This theology of possession has leaked out like a poison and has had detrimental impacts to the way that the church has worked to colonize land and people. And at this time must be addressed so for me, it has become clear that the climate crisis is a crisis of relationships. It has revealed to us the deep nature of the fall, of our separation, of our relationships between the world around us, with one another and with God. And I want to challenge you today to reconsider what we have lost in light of our neglection of Mary, who has long stood as a symbol of creation in right relationship with God. How might we reinstate her as a figure of hope? I ask you, what theologies of creation has the church adopted over recent centuries in particular, maybe without direct acknowledgement of them, but have aided and led to the creation around us in a state of disorder, chaos and crisis, and our fellow creatures alongside that? It is not just that we see a correlation between the theology of Mary and the environment, but that a changing theology of Mary as a model of submission has legitimized the domination of the natural world and creatures with it. When we look to Mary in the non-Western world, we quickly discover a Mary and therefore a Jesus who's not so removed from the world and who, who challenges this theology and the ideal of domination over it. Often understood rather as its intercessor and protector, having also traditionally been named the seat of wisdom, Mary, the one who perceives and communicates the will of God. So when we consider Mary, Boss proposes, it demands that we think again about our attitude towards the cosmos, which is our home and the God who makes and made and indwells it and in whom it dwells. So in a world where exploitation, domination and power struggles are seen as, inevitable, as the inevitability of human interaction and the norm of our relationships, I, I look to the non-Western Mariologists and what they offer towards a better example of a lifestyle shaped by a theology that holds Mary and creation more closely and therefore holds God and his creation more closely. And many of these theologians consider Marian imagery, spirituality and devotion as an essential protest to modernity through offering a subversive narrative of human relationships. In recent years, theologians involved in this dialogue have increasingly explored the role of pilgrimage in the religious communities of the South and the important sites of Marian devotion that are associated with these. Marian devotion holds a role in the religious practices of resistance and criticism 
against a purely rationalised view and treatment of people, the world and God. Mary remains a source of empowerment that enables people to challenge the injustices of the world and reimagines places of boundaries and separation as places of encounter. So in this presentation, I have promoted the view that the climate crisis is a crisis of relationships. And it is this heart of the matter that needs to be addressed by the church and everyone. If we only ever talk about solutions as lifestyle changes, or more specifically, how can we become better consumers? We may be in danger of promoting the same individual and self-sufficient culture that is in part to blame for the changing of our climate. We place the blame in the hands of isolated individuals, individuals who are overburdened, burnt out and overwhelmed. At a conference that imagines the church in a sustainable way, it is vital that we understand how the church currently is and consider what is our current theology and how has it shaped our lifestyles rather than to imagine separate small clubs of the church that just get the work done. This requires us to widen the boundaries of church that we engage, the church that we engage with and listen to this wider dialogue across denominations and cultures. And so as in every time, our work of this time is for unity. And I'm, I'm sad to see that this might be, this, this hope for fighting climate change actually is revealing deep divisions. So when I read the letters of Paul to the early church, living in a time with an urgent task, he continually challenged them about the divisions that very quickly emerged. So to conclude, that doesn't mean that we're not transformed in the work of God's sanctifying spirit, nor do we um, are not challenged and responding to what's necessary change, but we don't presume to do God's will as a divided body, for this is a contradiction in itself. The task for the church in this time is the same as it has been in every time, to acknowledge the kingdom of God in our midst and to work for the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus entrusted to his disciples. Reimagining and sustaining church is a task that requires us to remain the church and to seek her unity, to challenge the dominant narrative of human relationships, the narrative of separation, that has led us into a time of climate crisis that we face today. Thank you for your time and attention. I know it's hot and it's been a long morning so far, so thank you for engaging. Thank you, Emily. That was um, so fascinating and really, for me particularly, I, I feel like it opened a huge number of areas I haven't thought particularly deeply about, so a lot there. It, I think we might have time just for one question if someone's quick. You can either add to the chat or maybe raise your hand and um, Oh, we've got one here. So uh, from Mother Cherry, have you seen if there are more images of Mary that give back her exalted status today? Have you kind of looked at the different images? Um, I think more of them are found. So one critique was given of the statue of Mary at Lourdes, which is kind of her um, standing on her own without child, kind of downcast. Um, and those are kind of the Western images that particularly Sarah Jane Voss highlights. I think a lot of the models she looks to is the non-Western world. Um, I can't think of like specific images off the top of my head. I wouldn't know the names of them. Um, yeah, I'm sorry not to be able to give more specific answers of that, but certainly I think this is the beginning of, of me looking into this and I'm not Catholic myself. So it's a whole kind of new world in a sense. It's very quite alien to me. Um, and so certainly the non-Western world is a voice that definitely wants to be engaging with us and is, and is a brilliant example of this that we can learn from. Wonderful. Um, Emily, thank you so much. That was a, a, really, a really brilliant paper. Um, I'm sure you could probably message Emily in the chat if you see her in other sessions, if you wanted to still throw out another question or carry on. Um, we do have to wrap up to allow some time to, to head to other sessions. Um, so 
just to say we'll be taking a five minute break and then Emily is actually going to be taking over the hosting in this room um, to host uh, Jeremy Pulson, who will be presenting the gospel according to permaculture. So stick in the room if you want to stay for that or else head through to the other room. Um, but thank you for coming. <laughs>